Well, good morning. We are so grateful that you are here again, that you are back. It is October the 2nd today, and so we're going to be reading Psalms 99, Isaiah chapter 29, Ephesians chapter 1, and Proverbs chapter 18. Then we have one article that uh, comes from the book of uh, Ephesians. In all your getting, above all, get understanding. And so let's turn in our Bibles. We're going to get started here. And we are going to begin with Psalms chapter 99. Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king's strength also loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the cloudy pillar, they kept his testimonies and the ordinance he gave them. You answered them, O Lord our God. You were to them God who forgives, though you took vengeance on their deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. For the Lord our God is holy. Amen. Turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 29. <clears throat> Isaiah and chapter 29. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel the city where David dwelt. Add year to year, let feasts come around. Yet I will distress Ariel. There shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be to me as Ariel. I will encamp against you all around. I will lay siege against you with a mound, and I will raise siege works against you. You shall be brought down. You shall speak out of the ground. Your speech shall be low out of the dust. Your voice shall be like a medium's out of the ground, and your speech shall whisper out of the dust. Moreover, the multitude of your foes shall be like fine dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones like chaff that passes away. Yes, it shall be in an instant, suddenly, you will be punished by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. The multitude of all the nations who fight against Ariel, even all who fight against her and her fortress and distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall even be as when a hungry man dreams, and look, he eats but he awakes and his soul is still empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams, and look, he drinks, but he awakes and indeed he is faint and his soul still craves. So the multitude of all the nations shall be who fight against Mount Zion. Pause and wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. 
for the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is literate, saying, read this, please. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then the book is delivered to one who is illiterate, saying, read this, please. And he says, I am not literate. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men, therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. They say, Who sees us, and who knows us? Surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing made say of him who made it, He did not make me? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, He has no understanding? Is it not yet a very little while till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be esteemed as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to nothing. The scornful one is consumed, and all who watch for iniquity are cut off, who make a man an offender by a word, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate, and turn aside the just by empty words. Therefore, thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, nor shall his face now grow pale. But when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will hallow my name and hallow the Holy One of Jacob and fear the God of Israel. These also who erred in spirit will come to understanding and those who complained will learn doctrine. And that is chapter number 29. It's interesting listening to this chapter, how uh, it is going to complement and merge with Ephesians chapter 1. And so we are going to the book of Ephesians now, and we will take a look here at Ephesians and chapter 1. The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians. I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, am writing to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Wonderful, wonderful chapter. And you know, that is one of the Ephesians prayers uh, starting 16, 17, 18, going on through. And you can pray that for yourself. Put you in there. Put you in there and pray that for yourself. Amen. Now we are going to go back to the book of Proverbs and uh, finish up our Bible reading today by reading Proverbs and uh, chapter number 18. Proverbs such a good such a good book to be reading over and over and over Proverbs chapter 18 a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire he rages against all wise judgment a fool has no delight in understanding but in expressing his own heart when the wicked comes, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes reproach. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. It is not good to show partiality to the wicked or to overthrow the righteous in judgment. The fool's lips enter into contention and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of the talebearer are like tasty trifles, and they go down into the inmost body. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it, and are safe. The rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his own esteem. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? The heart of the prudent acquires knowledge, 
and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Casting lots causes contentions to cease and keeps the mighty apart. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. The poor man uses entreaties, but the rich answers roughly. A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And that is the reading for today. Now we are going to go back to the book of Ephesians. And there is an article entitled, In All Your Getting, Above All, Get Understanding. And this is based on Ephesians 1 and verse number 18. <clears throat> I'm going to put something keep my throat from coughing or whatever. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul begins the book of Ephesians by telling believers that he is specifically praying that the eyes of your understanding may be opened. Ephesians 1, 18, the New King James Version. He pointed out that if their understanding was opened, then, notice the sequence, then you will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Numerous scriptures affirm this progression. For example, Psalms 119 34 says, Give me understanding that I may observe your law. Psalms 119 and verse 73 similarly declares, Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Because understanding is so crucial, Paul specifically prays for his spiritual son, Timothy, that the Lord will give you understanding in everything. 2 Timothy 2 and verse number 7. The Bible often groups knowledge, understanding, and wisdom together. For example, Proverbs 24, 3 and 4 states, by wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. And by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. But while the three are often mentioned together, numerous passages affirm that attaining wisdom is the ultimate objective. Significantly, understanding is what takes knowledge and shows how to correctly apply it, thus producing wisdom. So there can't be wisdom, the highest goal, without understanding. Because understanding is so crucial to being able to experience the benefits and blessings of God's Word, the enemy spends much time in trying to keep us from that pursuit. One of his common tactics is to sow doubt, seeking to undermine our confidence in the truth 
by asserting that something is too complex or too difficult to be understood. If people accept such a claim, most will give up and not try to acquire understanding on that particular subject. Whether or not it is their intention, one of unfortunate effects that has come from a large portion of the higher criticism movement is that very thing. Introduced in 1787 and still extremely active and very sophisticated today, instead of promoting great greater understanding that comes from honest inquiry, higher criticism scholars with a strong anti-supernatural bias adopt as their sta starting point a rejection of must much traditional understanding and theology in favor of speculations and creative attempts at literary reconstructionism, alleging that there is so much internal confusion or so many contradictions, errors, and inconsistencies that no one can really trust the Bible. Higher critics usually dismiss the scriptures or portions of them even before attempting to meaningfully investigate and understand them. The result, because of their inherent biases, they tend to plant more seeds of doubt and discouragement on biblical subjects and issues than they do any insight or illumination. Two centuries ago, some tried to use higher criticism to discourage founding father John Quincy Adams, claiming that with so many versions of the Bible in existence, and with them all differing from one another, that it was impossible to know what was and was not true. They especially asserted that it was ridiculous to suggest that Jesus could have been divine and also have been crucified, that if he had been divine, he would have exercised his divine power to prevent his crucifixion. According to their claims, Jesus was really only a man, just a teacher. Adams forcefully repelled to the arguments about so many confusing Bible versions and the alleged non-divinity of Jesus. And I quote from John Quincy Adams, you ask me what Bible I take as the standard of my faith? The Hebrew, the Samaritan, the Old English translation, or what? I answer, the Bible containing the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Any Bible that I can read and understand. The New Testament I have repeatedly read in the original Greek, in the Latin, in the Genevan Protestant, and in Sackey's Catholic French translations, in Luther's German translation, in the common English Protestant, and in the Doe English Catholic or uh, Jude. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Anyway, some kind of a translation. I take any one of them for my standard of faith. But the Sermon upon the Mount commands me to lay up for myself treasures not upon earth, but in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 and 20. 
My hope of a future life is all founded upon the gospel of Christ, and I cannot cavil or quabble about uh, a way not single words and ambiguous expressions, but the whole tenor of his conduct by which he sometimes positively asserted and at others countenanced his disciples in asserting that he was God. You think it blasphemous to believe that the omnipotent creator could be crucified? God is a spirit. The spirit was not crucified. The body of Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. The spirit was beyond the reach of the cross. John Quincy Adams was not going to let any supposed criticism of the Bible distract him from what was self-evident in the scriptures, such as the Sermon on the Mount and the need for a personal Savior. Nor would he allow them to hinder his pursuit to grow in knowledge so as to gain understanding and with it wisdom. Proverbs 25.2 declares, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. A divine game of hide-and-seek. Questions are marvelous. They are never to be feared or discouraged, for they are the invitations to curiosity that leads us on a most glorious quest in search of truth, the adventure of a lifetime that will ultimately find its satisfaction in a person who is that truth. If we truly desire to understand something that God has said or something the Bible declares to be true, there is a sure pathway to find it. But it requires the humility, courage, and willingness for us to first stand under that truth with open hands and an open heart that our eyes might be opened and we would be granted revelation. Nevertheless, Herbert Spencer, a noted British social philosopher, 1820 to 1903, remarked, There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. And so, John Quincy Adams, he was ready to search the Bible for finding an answer to any kind of question that might come his way. Thank you for being with me today and for reading the Bible for October the 2nd. You have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will see you again tomorrow.